The following is the presentation of the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion. All content presented is the exclusive intellectual property of CCDI. Any sharing, reproduction, or use of this material or content as is, or in any form, requires the express written permission of CCDI. Should you wish to use this content in any way, please contact Anne-Marie Pham, CEO at the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion at annemariefam at ccdi.ca. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, please note a quick disclaimer. CCDI is not liable for any claims, losses, or damages of any kind arising out of or in any way related to the information provided in this presentation. There's some information here on our upcoming events. As you can see, we have several webinars that you can register for at www.ccdi.ca. Those are Unlearning Fatphobia, Black History Month, Unlearning Anti-Black Racism, Anti-Semitism, and the French version of today's webinar as well. CCDI also offers the Canadian Certified Inclusion Professional or CCIP certification, which is a professional designation designed to assess the knowledge and experience of diversity and inclusion professionals against a standard set of predefined competencies. The next cohort registration closes on March 7th, 2023. So thank you again for joining us today. My name is Ashley and I will be facilitating today's webinar. We have a few housekeeping notes uh, to go over before we begin. To ensure that you can hear the presentation, we have muted everyone's line. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write them in the Q&A box. We encourage you to take notes throughout the webinar. Although the presentation slide deck will not be distributed, we are recording this session, including the questions at the end. Employer partners of CCDI will have access to the recording as well as previous webinars in our knowledge repository. All right, before we begin the presentation, I would like to take a moment to honor the land that I reside on. I am located in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, which is part of what my people call Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship with Mi'kmaq, uh, which Mi'kmaq and Mal Maliseet peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. I'm starting our session off with this acknowledgement to show recognition, honor, and respect to all those who have come before me here on the land of my ancestors. This is part of my effort to create and establish healthy and reciprocal relations that work towards reconciliation. If you would like to learn more about the history, traditions, and stories of the land on which you live, I highly recommend checking out the Whose Land app, which is uh, located on the bottom of the screen here. Um, and we will also drop this link into the chat. Okay, so with that, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Fundamentals. Uh, we're very happy to have you all with us today. Um, the, today's presentation is free, so I know we have quite a large number of participants. Uh, my name is Ashley Shepard, and I will be facilitating today's presentation. I'm a manager of Learning and Knowledge Solutions here at CCDI. My pronouns are she and her. A few facts about me. I am Indigenous. I am Mi'kmaq from Newfoundland. I have eight years of experience working in higher education um, and a passion for teaching youth and creating inclusive learning environments. I happen to also be the lead facilitator for CCDI's youth education program, See Different. If you have any young folks in your household that you think would uh, benefit from diversity, equity, and inclusion training, please feel free to check out our website, www.cdifferent.ca. Um, I am an avid lover of theater, travel, languages, and my two dogs, Millie and Watson. And for the visually impaired, I am a 30-year-old woman with a big smile and long curly brown hair. All right, so our agenda for today is as follows. I'm going to start by defining the language used in this field, focusing on the terms diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Next, we'll be talking about the many dimensions of diversity and how these dimensions impact how we perceive the world. Then we'll discuss the social and economic imperative for addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Finally, we will talk about some practical initiatives on the individual, team, and organizational level to build more inclusive and equitable workplaces. Just a reminder, uh, I've had a question in the chat, just a reminder that we are recording today's session. Thank you. Okay, so our first section is about defining the language. However, 
Before we start our deep dive into terminology, I would like to take a brief moment to talk about acronyms. As we've come to understand more about the world and people's individual experiences, the words that we use to describe our goals in this industry have had to expand as well. Because of this, there are many different acronyms used in this field, which can be a bit confusing. So I'd like to take a moment here to walk through a short timeline of the development of these acronyms. Previously, workplace efforts focused primarily on diversity. So the common terminology was diversity training, diversity initiatives, et cetera. During this time, much of the focus was on increasing representation in organizations through things like affirmative action and employment equity, which you might've heard of, without much focus on the systems that reinforce underrepresentation. A note here that representation is actually different from diversity. Representation focuses on visible differences in the workplace and ensuring that everyone has a seat at the table. However, it is only one of very several important elements in the diversity equation. So over time, the term inclusion was added to this uh, acronym and it became diversity and inclusion or D&I. This was in order to begin to address systemic exclusion. And this addition was important because while diversity on its own was focused on individual representation, inclusion brought in a focus on the collective. So the acronym DNI was about creating an environment that values and respects individuals for their differences to the benefit of the collective. DNI has since developed into DEI and EDI, which are quite common these days. And DEI is what we use here at CCDI. DEI includes the term equity, which means that processes and programs are fair, impartial, and offer equal possible outcomes for any individual. Including equity acknowledges that in order to achieve inclusion in the workplace, employees all need a fair chance to participate. More on this later. Um, DEI and EDI are not much different, but just so we're clear, sometimes EDI is chosen to communicate a focus on equity first. More recently, this acronym has evolved again, of the more modern acronyms, IDEA may the, be the one that you see most often. The added A in IDEA generally indicates accessibility. Organizations that use the term IDEA want to specifically mention accessibility as an important aspect of their work. I mentioned that CCDI uses the term DEI, so you might wonder why we don't use IDEA since it's becoming increasingly common. It goes back to these acronyms describing our actions and our goals as an organization. While accessibility is absolutely important to us and is a goal for us, we are, even as a DEI organization, still in the beginning stages of our actions towards accessibility. And we don't feel like we've put in enough work yet to use that acronym in a meaningful way. Moving on, we have DEIB, which is another newer acronym that includes the word belonging. Belonging can be described as the ultimate outcome of DEI efforts. So DEIB emphasizes that being included does not necessarily mean that you have a sense of belonging in an organization. Finally, JEDI adds justice to the conversation to drive home that this work cannot be done without addressing the deep systematic injustices that have occurred and continue to occur. I will note, however, that JEDI might be best suited for larger scale organizations that have the power and resources to meaningfully bring about justice like the UN, for example. And of course, there have been criticisms of this acronym due to its connections with the Star Wars franchise and Disney, um, but it's still an, an excellent acronym. I hope this brief outline has given you some context and understanding of the terms that are used in this field. And now we're going to dive in a little bit deeper and talk about those terms in more detail. Let's begin with a question for our audience. What is diversity? What does that term mean to you? I would love to hear from those of us who are here today. We've got quite a large uh, group. I'm gonna just take a, take a moment to look at our chat and look at our question and answer box. So feel free to share. What does diversity mean to you? What is diversity? Diversity of thought, someone's shared. That's excellent. A group of people, lived experiences, inclusion of all walks of life, difference, variety. Excellent. Multiple ways of perceiving things. Oh my goodness, the chat is just going faster than I can read. This is awesome. Diversity, individuality, mosaic, the mix. Excellent. A variety of beings, all voices heard. Oh my goodness, I could go on and on. This is excellent. Thank you so much for sharing, everyone. This is wonderful. So we at CCDI like to define diversity as simply the mix. And someone in the chat actually did use this term. So at CCDI, we refer to this mix in two different ways. 
The first definition of the mix refers to the mix of ingredients that make up an individual's identity. Those ingredients are vast and varied, and they can include ethnicity, gender, life experiences, values, economic status, and so many other factors that shape our perspectives. Our identity acts as the lens through which we view the world. It grounds us, guides us, and defines both who we are and what we do. But even that is constantly changing. And as we have new experiences, we learn. And so the ingredients that make us who we are change. Who we were at breakfast is slightly different from who we are when we go to bed. The second definition of the mix is that diversity exists within any group of people. The moment we have two people in a room, we naturally have diversity because we have two completely unique individuals with different perspectives of the world. So we know that diversity is dynamic. It's constantly changing. And we know that we're surrounded by diversity all the time because each person is unique. The last piece of the diversity puzzle is that you will always be an expert in your own diversity, but you will never be an expert in someone else's because you don't know all of the ingredients that make up someone else's unique mix. This is where inclusion comes in. Inclusion, um, we, uh, we know from experience that when humans come together, we're capable of solving complex problems. However, inclusion or the act of coming together is not something that simply occurs. Sometimes recognizing or pointing out people's differences rather than their commonalities can cause discomfort or conflict. For this, for this reason, where diversity is the mix, inclusion is about getting the mix to work well together. We have to make the choice to be inclusive. It's about making a mindful effort to ensure that everyone feels valued, respected, and supported. This in turn works to create a culture that embraces and values all that diversity has to offer. So to reiterate, diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice. Um, and so since diversity is a fact and inclusion is a choice, how do we begin to make that choice? One way to do so is by acknowledging individual differences and accommodating different needs. This is where equity comes into play. So the simple fact is that different people need different things. And so in order to be inclusive, we have to provide equitable resources so that everyone can contribute and achieve to their fullest potential. Sometimes this means making adjustments or accommodations to eliminate barriers that prevent people from being included. You folks might have seen the pictures that I'm about to show. So the first picture that we have here is of a tree that leans to the left. That left side has an abundance of apples and the right side has very few. Underneath the left side is someone catching one of the many, many apples, and underneath the right, another person is waiting, but none have dropped. This is a visual representation of inequality. Some individuals have a more difficult time accessing opportunities than others. This could be due to the cost of access, language barriers, technological barriers, and the list goes on and on. With this next picture, both people are given a ladder of equal size to access the apples on the tree. As you can see in the picture, this does not fix the problem because the tree is still leaning closer to the person on the left and the person on the right still can't reach the apples. This shows the challenges with giving everyone the same tools and opportunities. And with, with equality, the assumption is that if everyone gets the same ladder, the problem is resolved. But the concept of equality only works when everyone starts at the same level. In this case, it didn't consider that the tree is leaning in one direction and therefore providing an advantage to the person on the left while being a barrier to the person on the right. In this last picture, the person on the right is given a longer ladder so that they can actually reach the apples on the tree, while the person on the left still has the shorter ladder, yet is able to reach the apples regardless because the tree is still leaning towards them. We can see from this example that if we provide everyone with the right, with the same resources, pardon me, we often find that there are individuals who are still left out. Equity provides people with the right resources for their individual needs. It emphasizes uh, individual concerns and providing unique accommodation measures based on what barriers people are facing. This is a fundamental step for cultivating inclusion. We're not done though. There's one final piece to this diversity puzzle. In this final picture, structures have been added to support the tree and push it back to its upright position, rather than allowing it to continue leaning to the left. This represents justice, which works to fix the broken system in order to offer equal access to tools and opportunities to both individuals. 
Justice requires us to think systematically about how current societal norms and ways of doing things are creating inequalities. Justice-oriented solutions do take time to implement and can be more costly as they require us to make systemic changes. However, the benefit is that when we remove these root causes of inequality, we create a more accessible and equitable experience for everyone. So we spoke earlier about the mix of ingredients that makes us who we are. Now we're going to talk in more detail about the many ingredients or dimensions of diversity that come together to form our identity. So as we know, it's through the combination of these different ingredients or dimensions that we form our perspectives of the world. We're going to look now at a chart that shows these dimensions in layers, starting with the first layer, which is personality. I like to think of this chart as the identity onion um, because each peeled back layer reveals a new aspect of our identity. So we're starting our identity onion with personality. Our personality is the core of who we are. And it's an aspect of a person's identity that tends to stay the same, sometimes even when we want it to change. There are many different theories about personality, with the most well-known being that it consists of five dimensions, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. But there are lots of other theories. For example, there's a theory that lists over 4,000 different personality traits. The general idea across these theories is that these traits can develop and change over time, but they don't change easily. I, for example, am a very outgoing and energetic person, but I've certainly had moments in my life where I wished I was a bit quieter or more introverted, but alas, no change has yet occurred. <laughs> um, next up, we have our internal dimensions. So internal, internal dimensions include aspects of a person's identity that are outside of their control. For example, a person's age or their race. It's important to note that while these dimensions are sometimes invisible, at times they're not. Think about a person's age. Sometimes we can tell how old people are, but other times it's difficult. An important thing to keep in mind here is that because these aspects of our identity are often outside of our control, we also cannot control people making judgments about us based on them. Taking the age example, pardon me, taking the age example again, we can be judged for looking older or younger than we really are, and there's not much that we can do about that. So our next dimension is our external dimensions. These are aspects of a person's identity that we do have control over and that we can typically change if we choose to. This layer often determines where we live, who we develop friendships or relationships with, and what we do for work. Essentially, this layer tells us a lot about the type of people we like to spend our time with. Next, we're gonna get a bit broader. The next dimension of a person's, uh, a person's identity comes from their organizational dimensions. So for young people, this would focus on their schooling environment. For those out of school, this focuses on the work environment. The focus here is not just about who you are right now in your organization, uh, i.e. your salary or your status, but who you have been, your, work, your previous work experiences, and who you may yet become, opportunities you're given for promotion or professional development. Having a supportive work environment can positively impact your career, and in contrast, not having one can be very detrimental. Finally, we arrive at global dimensions. These are what we take from the environment around us and make our own. Most often, this aspect of our identity comes from how we are affected by major global events in our life in our lifetimes. I'm sure you can all think of the major global event that we are experiencing. We have been experiencing for several years. Uh, <laughs> um, if you want to share in the chat, feel free. But um, I'm speaking, of course, of the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic has impacted us across the globe. It has affected workplaces, education, family dynamics. Every single part of our lives has changed due to this event. And it has an impact on who we are. We also, there some other examples include the war in Ukraine, mass shootings in the United States and even in Canada, climate change, and so much more. We internalize these events and they therefore play an important part in shaping who we become. Here's an example. In a previous generation, 9-11 was one of these important events. People who were old enough to remember what happened remember what the world was like before 9-11 and, and after. It became very different for them because of that event. So it's easy to see from this onion chart, as I like to call it, 
that our identities are very complex. And this complexity helps to explain why, although we will always be an expert in our own diversity, we can never truly be an expert in someone else's. With that in mind, let's find out a little bit more about the diversity that we have in the room here today. So my question to you is, what is one characteristic of your identity that most defines who you are? Keep in mind that it does not have to be one that's on our list here um, and that you should focus on how you define yourself, not on how others define you. Please feel free to ch share as much or as little as you're comfortable with. I'd love to hear from you um, in the chat. Uh, oh, we've got lots motivated, sense of humor, positive attitude, extrovert, queer, immigrant woman, outgoing, person with a disability, an introvert, a survivor. Oh my goodness, my language, um, being, being a francophone, uh, neurodivergent. Oh, this is fantastic. My gosh, so many answers. Oh, we have being kind, curious, um, my gender, bubbly and loud. There are a lot of answers coming in here. Thank you so much, everyone. It's so great to see you participating. This is great kindness, my laugh. Oh, I love that. I, yeah, language for me is 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 truly um, is truly lovely. I wish that I had grown up in a in a household that was bilingual, but um, I've I've certainly. Oh, this is amazing. My nationality, empathy, and goofiness. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. I really appreciate this. Um, the lesson here that we have is that when it comes to working together, diversity is a huge asset because everyone has a completely different worldview that has been shaped by their experiences and, the, and in life. And when we're able to bring our unique perspectives to that mix we were talking about earlier, we automatically increase the amount of knowledge and understanding at the table. All right, so it's on that note that I'd like to now discuss the social and economic imperative for addressing DEI in the workplace. Let's start by looking at Canada's shifting demographics. So in 2021, the government conducted a census of the Canadian population. Let's take a look at some of the data from that census. So as of 2021, 47.5% of employed workers in Canada are women and 53% of university educated workers are women. One in five people 15 years or older are living with a disability. Racialized people make up 26.53% of the total population. This is up from 22.3% in 2016 when the last census was held. This category comprises persons who are non-white in skin color and does not include Indigenous people, for reference. In 2021 and 2022, Canada's population grew by a record 703,000 people, which is a 1.8% increase. The vast majority of this growth, 93.5% in fact, was due to immigration. Currently, one in four Canadians were born outside of Canada. The Indigenous population in Canada is now 5%, but it is the fastest growing population in Canada, having grown by 9.4% from 2016 to 2021 surpassing the growth of non-Indigenous population over the same period, which was 5.3%. Finally, due to the increased life expectancy in Canada and people retiring later in life, there's greater generational diversity in the workforce. We now have five generations in the workplace, which is the first time in history this has happened. Um, so with these significant increases of equity-deserving groups in the labour market, the social and economic imperative for addressing DEI in the workplace is clear. But before we dive into the specifics of why that is the case, let me pose a question to our group. What do you folks think are some of the specific benefits of formally addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, whether it's social or economic? I'd love to hear from you in the chat. New ideas, more engaged employees, excellent, belonging, innovation, positive changes, increased creativity, safe spaces, making everyone feel comfortable, larger range of perspectives, entrepreneurship, oh, this is fantastic, mental health, increasing value and acceptance, growth, creating awareness, better productivity. Oh, this is amazing, fantastic. Oh, better collaboration, better serving our communities. Amazing, I'm amazing. We have such a good audience here today. This is great. Psychologically safe culture in the workplace. That's a huge one. We uh, we actually are going to be addressing psychologically safe workplaces in our upcoming COPE events, which are happening in May. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing in the chat. This is great. So 
In fact, you've actually hit a lot of points uh, in the chat here that we have on our list. Um, obviously, these are only a few of the benefits. Um, there are many, many more. But many studies have been conducted over the years on the benefits of formally addressing DEI in the workplace. And they found that these benefits include a reduction in discrimination and an ability to respond to the needs of key stakeholders, fair, inclusive policies, practices, and programs, higher levels of employee engagement and satisfaction, which reduces turnover. Many folks said that in the chat. Increased innovation and problem solving. Again, a lot of folks hit on that point. The ability to attract and retain diverse talent. Um, the mitigation and minimization of legal risks, but above all, the long-term sustainability of the organization. So this leads me to another question for you folks. These are some of the benefits of formally addressing DEI in the workplace. What do you think are some of the risks of not doing so? What would you say are some of the risks of not addressing DEI in the workplace? High turnover, isolation, discrimination, conflict, harassment. Yes, employee unhappiness, unfilled labor needs. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, losing high quality staff, groupthink, unconscious bias, missed opportunities. Oh my goodness, absenteeism, yes, absolutely. Becoming irrelevant as a business, excellent. Yes, less productivity, reputational risk, lack of trust in the organization, and a feeling of not belonging. Again, there are so many answers here. I could just go on and on. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, everyone. Um, as as you, you know, you've, you've all touched on a lot of these. As you would expect, by not investing time and resources into DEI efforts, organizations risk increased costs due to litigation and complaint, lower employee engagement and retention, limited access to talent pools, higher turnover, lower productivity, lower levels of innovation and teamwork and collaboration, a decline in community and customer relations, brand or reputation damage, and overall not uh, organizations not being sustainable, falling, you know, falling down on the job. Overall, organizations have to focus not only on their bottom line or their product or their people, but on how these three things are interconnected. We know based on demographic trends that workforces are diverse and that diversity is continuing to grow and evolve. The social and economic imperative then is clear. By creating workplaces that encourage and support a diverse talent pool, organizations are able to realize the full potential of their employees and become more responsive and adaptive to the changing needs of the market, thus ensuring their sustainability in the long term. It's very clear here that uh, the social and economic imperative of, of why we have to address DEI in the workplace. So on that note, whether you are new to the world of DEI or a longtime practitioner, I hope that we've provided you with some new knowledge and language to use when discussing the importance of addressing DEI in the workplace. Let's now move on to our final section here and discuss some practical initiatives that you can start today to begin building a more inclusive and equitable culture in your workplace. So we've divided this final section into three parts. We have initiatives focusing on self, on teams, and then finally the organization. Each one of us has a different sphere of influence in our workplace. So hopefully everyone here today will be able to walk away with some initiatives to start within your places of work or even in your daily lives. Let's start with practical initiatives on the individual level. So the first initiative here is to start practicing critical self-reflection. And we can do this by asking ourselves, how and where am I of how my identity influences my assumptions and actions at work? This requires us to think about our own dimensions of diversity, who or what influence the development of those dimensions and how they impact our working life. The second initiative that we have here is to expand your circle, seek input and feedback from people with different perspectives and different life experiences. Our brains tend to push us to be with people who are like us or that we have an affinity with. So push that tendency aside and make the time to connect with colleagues who you haven't gotten to know. Third, that we have here is to work on mitigating our biases. So we all have bias, we know that, <laughs> whether those biases are conscious or unconscious, which often tends to be the case. And these biases can shape how we think about and react to a person based on their race, their gender, and so many other factors. 
we can never completely eliminate bias, but we can, or we can, but we can learn to manage it. Um, so the first step in this process is learning to identify our biases. It is only by becoming aware of our bias and making sure that those biases that we hold are not unconscious that we can avoid the harmful stereotyping and discriminatory practices that often result from bias. So bringing the, the unconscious to the conscious. We can start to do that and we can start to identify our biases by examining our thoughts when we have them rather than letting them pass by and then recognizing when those thoughts are attached to patterns of behavior. Finally, once we begin to recognize our own biases and our behavioral patterns, the last step is to actively work to dismiss stereotypes or attitudes that are negatively affecting our interactions with people. A note here, of course, that resisting unconscious bias is lifelong work. Like, honestly, we have, we have webinars on this topic and we, we could go on for days because this is truly one of those things that is going to be a challenge for each and every one of us for our lifetime. It, bias is an insidious little thing that tends to grow and grow if we don't acknowledge it, bring it out into the open, and work to mitigate it. All right, our fourth practice that we have here is practicing allyship. So what is an ally? Does anyone, what, does anyone want to take a stab at what an ally is? I'd love to hear from you in the chat. What, is, what does it mean to be an ally? A partner, a friend, a support system? Excellent, an advocate, someone who has your back. Yes, a community. Yeah, this is great. Speaking up, a person for, yes, listener, a supporter, a champion, an ally, someone who uses their privilege to protect and mitigate risk but from other members of society. An individual that does not identify as a member of a particular community who is a support and advocate. Excellent, these are great answers. Working collaboratively, Thank you so much, everyone. Community defines allyship as a self-determined manner. That's great. Yeah, a coach or a mentor, definitely. Allyship is so many things. You know, there is, there is no one definition that truly encompasses what it means to be an ally. Um, I will just say, uh, oh, I, by the way, I've just been reminded to let everyone know that the chat is locked. We cannot, um, we're the only folks, myself and our lovely CCDI team are the only um, people who can see the chat, just so you know. Um, yeah, again, there's one last one here, someone who speaks up and shows up for a community. Fantastic. This is great. Thank you so much. This is, this is lovely. Um, so our definition here at CCDI of allyship is that an ally is a person in a position of privilege or power who makes consistent efforts to understand, uplift, empower, and support equity-deserving groups. It's, it's quite a general um, description, but let me give you a little bit more information about what it means, what we can do to show allyship, to demonstrate our allyship. So one way we can show up for people as an ally is to be an advocate, as those in the chat have already mentioned, for colleagues from equity deserving groups. An advocate might call out unfair omissions or make sure that everyone is being included in meetings and events. An ally is someone who amplifies the voices of and openly supports individuals from equity deserving groups. We can do this by always giving credit for the ideas of others. An ally acts as an upstander, not a bystander. An upstander shuts down, reports, and pushes back on offensive jokes and inappropriate comments, even if no one is outwardly hurt by them. We never know what's going on for, for, for others around us. Finally, we can act as a confidant for someone from an equity deserving group. A confidant creates a safe, trusting, and supportive environment where people can share their stories, their frustrations, and their experiences. There's so many ways that we can be, that we can show allyship to those around us. Um, again, this list that we have here and what I've just given is, is just a small drop in the bucket. Um, and we do have webinars at CCDI about allyship, allyship as well. So please feel free to check those out, if, um, especially if you are an employer partner. Okay, uh, the final one we have here is the platinum rule. So uh, I wonder if anyone's heard of the platinum rule before. Um, if anyone wants to type in the chat what, what the platinum rule is, that would be great. Um, oh, some folks that haven't, excellent, excellent. Um, yes, very good. We have some folks that know and some folks that don't. So for those of you that know, I'm sure a lot of folks have heard of the golden rule. The golden rule, of course, is to treat others the way that you want to be treated. Our suggestion here at CCDI is rather than treating others the way you want to be treated, 
we use the platinum rule, which says that we treat others the way they want to be treated. Excellent. Shout out to all the folks in the chat who, who knew the answer here. So obviously the platinum rule requires us to make the choice to first ask what people need and then listen to what they are saying rather than assuming that we know what's best for them. We also have to be willing to share how we want to be treated. This allows for mutual understanding and for everyone to feel respected and heard. So yeah, the um, platinum rule versus the golden rule. These are important. All right, uh, before we jump into some team level initiatives, let me ask you all a question. What are some initiatives that you have in your team at your workplace that are helping to build you an inclusive culture? I'd love to hear what folks are already doing in this space to create more inclusive, equitable workplaces that are creating a sense of belonging. I'm curious. Oh, we've got some coffee chats, inclusion moments. Excellent, we actually talk about those later. Um, committees, oh, the 50-30 challenge. Uh, excellent, we're, uh, we're helping to support that. An EDI director, creating committees, acknowledging celebrations, mobilizing the workforce, raising awareness through policies. That's excellent, excellent. Um, updating forms to be more inclusive of family and gender diversity. Um, someone uh, said hosting hybrid meetings so that people can show up from home if needed. That's amazing, fantastic. Um, uh, do committees, inclusive language guide, um, a book club, excellent. Um, cultural awareness calendar, amazing. Multicultural events, we actually talk about that here in a moment. All staff training, a speak up policies. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, including pronouns and in all introductions, fantastic. Removing gender binaries and language. Oh my goodness, the, the list just goes on. This is amazing. Allowing people to be recognized, known as, or called by their preferred name across IT systems. Amazing, that's fantastic. A DEI working group, um, developing a land acknowledgement with indigenous partners and team building games. Okay, well, I could just go on and on. <laughs> this is fantastic. Oh, and unconscious bias training, well done. That's great. Um, so yeah, this is fantastic. We, you know, you've hit on a lot of the points that we're gonna talk about here, but to start with, educate yourself and educate your team. You know, take the time to seek out knowledge. There's a lot of folks here that said that they have book clubs and, and different movie clubs. That's that's an excellent way to do this. And of course we have, you know, we have our traditional sources like online articles and papers or webinars like this one, but there are also podcasts and YouTube channels about DEI in the workplace. Um, there are so many ways to learn about this. And what I wanna mention here, what's really important about this educating ourselves and our team is that by taking responsibility for our own education on these topics, we're taking the burden off of equity deserving groups from having to educate us about the challenges that they face. And this is truly, truly so important. You know, we, we need to take responsibility for our own knowledge and our own understanding of these spaces. And you've all done that by being here today with us at this webinar. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, second, we have mapping out our team's cultural assets. So I don't know if anyone has heard of cultural asset mapping before. It's derived from a traditional asset mapping framework where all the assets in a city or a community are identified and mapped out. And these can include schools, libraries, businesses, healthcare facilities, and much more. In much the same way, we can use cultural asset mapping to look at our team. So this is about looking at not just those elements directly linked to a person's job title, performance, or even their work history, but also looking at how elements such as gender, race, ethnicity, languages, and lived experiences can be additional cultural assets that enhance what a person brings to their position and to their organization. Essentially, cultural asset mapping is a tool to help your team understand all those assets that are available and how you can leverage those assets to improve and increase your team's feeling, feelings of satisfaction and belonging in the workplace. I wanna note here that this practice requires a great deal of trust. And even if you have a culture of trust, not everyone on your team may be willing to share this information with you, and that's okay. If they do decide to share this information, um, we need to make sure that we're protecting everyone's privacy. So before collecting anyone's data, we should ensure that the privacy, um, that you know where that data is going to be kept, who has access to it, and that you have technical measures in place to ensure their anonymity or confidentiality. We also have to ensure that we're only collecting data that we'll be able to action to some degree. 
and that whatever action that we take will positively impact the working experiences of our employees. So cultural asset mapping can be a, an amazing tool to improve team um, organization and teamwork and collaborative spaces and making sure we all know what we're working with. Um, but we have to do it right is important. All right, um, our third initiative on the team level is advocating for inclusion in policies, spaces, and events. There are a lot of folks that said that they're working on this right now at their organizations, which is fantastic. Um, so this can be done by promoting the use of inclusive language in the workplace, which a lot of folks have said they're doing, amazing. Um, establishing designated safe and brave spaces where people can come together to have courageous conversations and ensuring that events are scheduled in a time and place that is accessible to all team members. So we had someone here in the chat say that they have made um, all of their meetings via Zoom so that people could participate from home if they needed to, which is amazing. Um, finally, our last initiative here, we're reaching, we're getting close to the end here, but um, is to develop diversity moments and a diversity calendar. A lot of you have already said that you're doing this practice, which is so fantastic. Um, so just to explain to those of you who don't know, diversity moments are when a team sets time aside each month to discuss news and concepts related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and maybe what's happening, you know, in their organization or in their community. Um, and a diversity calendar, of course, is a calendar that details different religious and commemorative days around the world. I like to think of linking these two things. So you can have diversity moments and use your diversity calendar to talk about as a conversational starting point to discuss various events that are coming up, ask if anyone on your team will be observing those events or any particular events, and what you could do at the office to accommodate or celebrate that person and the event that they might be celebrating. So um, a lot of really great stuff. There's, there's a lot of stuff happening in our chat here, and it looks like people are really starting to take these efforts and, and make these make decisions to make more inclusive and equitable workplaces. All right, so our final uh, practical initiative section here is the organizational level. It's at this level that buy-in from senior management at your organization is typically required. And even with that buy-in, implementing these types of changes across your organization is going to require time, hard work, and more than one champion to drive these initiatives forward. So where you're at in your organization with this, you might be just starting or you might be further along in your diversity, equity and inclusion journey. But hopefully these will, you know, these initiatives that we have will give you some ideas. So our first initiative here is to examine your recruitment and hiring practices. Are you using inclusive language in your job postings? For instance, if you're asking for good communication skills on a job posting, that might lead a, a potential applicant with English as their second language to think that their communication skills might not be good enough for the role. Communication is a subjective skill, and if you want that in a candidate, a better option might be to devise a means to test their communication skills so that you can find out in the job and later on in the job um, application process. Where are jobs at your organization being posted? Have you considered also posting on, for example, um, Career Contessa or iHispano? You have to go where the people are, right, when we're looking. So not just Indeed, but we can expand where we're posting these jobs. Is there bias in your screening process? Are you looking for someone who fits into your company culture? If so, it might be time to expand that culture to include different perspectives. As we know, diversity is bringing those perspectives together. And we have so much innovation when that happens. And um, it's, it's so worth it in the end. Finally, moving to the interview stage, do you use standard questions for each candidate? Because you should. Do you, you know, um, we need to be able to, to, to provide an equitable interview process, especially. Do you ask about accommodations? If your facilities are not barrier free, then this, of course, can be an issue for a person with a dis disability. Consider moving towards panel interviews, having diverse folks on your interview panels, and which will help to reduce bias in the hiring process. Finally, not everyone knows how to negotiate salary. In some cultures, there is no negotiation. And research has also shown that women are usually less likely to negotiate for a higher salary than men. Consider equal pay for each role level instead. So those are a few of the recruitment and hiring practices that we can change and, and change today to start making workplaces more equitable and, and hiring diverse candidates.
The second initiative that we have here is to offer work-life integration and flexible policies. Again, this is something that's happening top down. This is not something that you and your team can start, but you can certainly um, try to try, you know, advocate for it in your, in your organization. So by offering flexible hours, policies to parents um, to support parents and caregivers of any gender, paid time off, a sick leave policy that includes mental health days and inclusive benefits such as paid adoption leave or transition related care for transgender employees, organizations can show that they value their employees as people and prioritize their well-being. This in turn increases employee engagement and productivity and reduces turnover. Our third initiative here is to provide training and development opportunities. These can include e-learning, coaching, one-on-one -on -one assessments, resource guides, workshops, professional development fund, even covering the costs for annual work-related conferences or major events. Finally, organizations can establish employee resource groups and, and DEI councils um, or committees. ERGs, um, which is employee resource groups, can also be known as affinity groups, employee network groups, uh, business resource groups. There's many different terms for these. But their primary purpose is to provide groups of employees with a formal structure within the organization to support their unique needs. In order for ERGs to be successful, they should be formalized, provided with a budget, and aligned with organizational goals. This is very important. DEI councils for, um, are the, the last one we have here, and they are typically made up of high-level leaders from across the organization. In general, this council develops or validates a comprehensive integrated DEI strategy that drives best practices and monitors progress against goals and objectives. So again, top down. So these are just a few examples of strategies that will help your organizations to attract and retain a diverse talent pool and remain competitive in an ever-changing job market. With that, we have actually come to the end of the presentation, if you can believe it. <laughs> um, and so to summarize what we've discussed here today, diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice. We are experts in our own dimensions of diversity, but not experts in the dimensions of others. Each of us has a unique perspective to offer based on our intersecting dimensions of diversity. The social and economic imperative for addressing DEI in the workplace is clear. And finally, there are actions we can take at the individual, team, and organizational level to build more inclusive and equitable workplaces. The final thing I'll say here, and thank you all so much for coming to today's webinar, is that a culture of belonging in the workplace only grows when organizations make the time to celebrate and promote diversity, establish equitable practices, and create truly inclusive environments. All right, so that ends the presentation. Thank you so much for listening, folks. I hope that you found uh, the presentation engaging and informative. Um, we now have some time for questions. Uh, to participate, you may type your question in the Q&A box on the screen. Uh, only I can see your question. And um, I will try to bring uh, address a few questions in order as they appear. Hopefully, we'll have some time. Um, and if you, we do run out of time, then please feel free to send us your question to research at ccdi.ca. That will be on our final slide here. And we'll answer your questions over email. So with that, I'm going to try and go through some of our questions that we have here. Um, there's one question that I can answer very easily. Does CCDI provide a number of resources or training? Um, absolutely. Um, I don't know uh, if any of uh, you here today are already employer partners of CCDI. If you are, you have access to our online repository. It's called our Knowledge Repository. It has all of the webinars that we have hosted throughout the years. So you can go back and watch webinars on so many different topics, um, or you could even use those webinars and, and ask your team to watch them as training exercises exercise. So please, 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 if you're already an employee partner of CCDI, take advantage of our knowledge repository. It is filled with learning paths and resources and articles and webinars. Um, so, uh, and if you need more information about that, feel free to uh, email us at, at research at ccdi.ca to find out where to find that. Um, but on to other questions. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts on the importance of an organizational diversity and inclusion statement or DEI or IDEA or whatever acronym you're using? Absolutely. Um, in order for organizations to move forward with a, with a DEI strategy, we have to start with a statement, right? We have to start with our intentions. Um, and as an example, CCDI, we, we don't use the term or the acronym IDEA yet 
because we have yet to actually implement actions, um, more actions towards accessibility. We've already started that process, but we don't feel that we're there yet. And so for that reason, our, our statement of diversity, equity, and inclusion is not yet including accessibility. But as we build and as we take more actions within the structure of our organization, we'll change our statement to match. So my only my thought on the importance of a, of a statement about DEI for your organization is that your statement should be implemented and actioned. We're not just making statements um, to, you know, into the air. Like we need to really see those things being implemented at an organization um, before we should be putting them up on our websites. Otherwise, it's just for show. Um, okay, interesting. So our organization isn't comfortable with using the language of equity, pushed for a diversity and inclusion committee. What resources are there to support the importance of including equity for risk averse apolitical organizations? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I, I'm not so I'm not sure that equity necessarily um, is is off limits to a, an organization that that um, is apolitical or risk averse. I think most importantly, it's about those practices that we spoke of in the organizational level. You know, what type of what are your hiring practices? What are what is the environment like um, for for in, individuals and employees? Um, I think it's really responsible of your organization that you haven't chosen yet to include equity. Um, perhaps though, it's something that you can work towards and and continue to to improve as you go along. Um, excellent. Thank you so much for these questions. Um, some ways to ensure that your diversity council is held accountable for actioning organizational goals. Um, that's a fantastic, that's 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 a great, uh, we at CCDI are, are implement, we have um, KPI, so we have key performance indicators. So we have, um, when we're creating things like diversity councils or um, employee resource groups, we wanna have actionable items, especially actionable items that we can track. So um, for example, you know, changing our job postings, you know, um, and a, a few of the other things that we mentioned. We really want to try and, and have a checklist that we can go through um, and, and have some way to track that. So um, yeah, oh my gosh, this is amazing. There's so many questions here. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment here and find another one. Um, Okay, um, how do we go about launching and growing employee resource groups? Do they form organically or does HR create them? That's an excellent question. Um, employee resource groups in the past have tended to come about because of inequities in the workplace where employees um, feel that their needs are not being addressed by the organization and they take those concerns up the ladder to higher levels um, to senior management and things like that. And so an employee resource group tends to be, um, let's say, a little late. Um, it's it's addressing the issue after it's already an issue. Um, and so it, it really depends on your organization and where you're at and, and how much buy-in you have from senior management. But it, it's really it the 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 goal of employee resource groups is to exist before there's a problem so that we can continue to have communication between senior management and employees about what the needs are of those particular groups um, and address them before they come up. So that's, um, unfortunately, a lot of ERGs, I think, are um, come about in the wrong direction. They, they show up because of issues, but hopefully we can, we organizations uh, can be proactive and implement them before there are um, challenges. Um, excellent question. Da, 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 da. They see this print. Um, my company puts a lot of emphasis on core values, hiring and rewarding based on them. They say this promotes a better culture. They also consider themselves a diverse employer and invest heavily in DEI initiatives. Um, can both of these concepts be true at the same time? Um, absolutely. You know, if you're emphasizing your core values of hiring and, and rewarding, then we and promoting a better culture. All of that, as we saw, when your when your hiring practices are inclusive and you're um, providing professional development opportunities for your employees to learn more about about DEI, especially if it's not just employees but management as well, um, those two can absolutely be interconnected. We need. It sounds like your company is really starting to make those steps towards being you know, being equitable and being inclusive, which is fantastic. 
Um, I'm just going to take a look here. These are great. Uh, rules or guidelines? Mm -hmm. We're getting a little close to the end here, so I'm just trying to find some, some good questions. Um, mm, do you have any advice on how to work with senior leadership who want to make a change, but are still reluctant to accept some hard truths about the organization and therefore unable to make any changes? That's a really good question. You know, I think I think that we see this a lot where we have one particular person in, in senior management or senior leadership who feels really strongly about diversity, equity and inclusion, um, but they're not necessarily able to recognize that their organization is not creating equitable spaces. You know, it's um, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think in that particular case, there are this is where, where they, we talk about the business case for DEI. A lot of businesses um, have to be provided with hard facts, data, um, demographics in order to see the, the, the business imperative for implementing DEI in the workplace. It's, it's unfortunate that it, it's, it, that the social imperative isn't enough, but, um, but often those two things don't always go hand in hand. They, they see the business imperative without thinking about the social imperative. Um, but um, it sounds like that person could really benefit from coming to one of our CCDI presentations. <laughs> um, I, hope that, I, I hope that you're able to work with that person to, to open their eyes to maybe some of the hard truths and hard facts that are happening on the ground at your organization. Um, depending on the relationship that you have, it might be as simple as having a conversation about things that you've seen or things that you've noticed. Um, or perhaps if that, you know, if, if, if it's all about the data, then um, the, you know, look, um, business case, um, looking at the business case for DEI initiatives would be a great way to start. Um, yeah, my goodness, we're, we're getting close to the end of time here. Um, Oh, um, a good, uh, just a quick one to throw in at the end. What is the difference between a DEI committee and an ERG? So uh, a DEI committee is typically formed by higher leadership. So people in senior management roles or um, people that have an ability to change policies and um, enact, you know, change and enact policies. Um, an ERG or an employee resource group is is more of a space where employees come together of any level. You know, it could be, you know, someone that's just started an entry level position all the way up to senior management um, who have something in common. So typically ERGs are formed um, uh, you know, there can be ERGs for women or ERGs for um, BIPOC folks or ERGs for folks from the LGBTQ2S plus community. Um, and those ERGs are often intended to support um, their, their support. They, they work together to support each other, but they also address issues in the workplace that, um, that they might be facing or um, policies that are not necessarily meeting their needs. Um, and they work together and they have a community to bring those issues um, to the forefront and, and, and have them addressed by senior leadership. So it's kind of a bottom up or a top down format. ERGs are more of the bottom up where employees are, are building a community together and DEI committees or councils or whatever you want to call them are typically top down where senior management is taking real um, actionable steps to creating a DEI. Usually a DEI council is goes hand in hand with creating or implementing a DEI strategy for the organization that aligns with the um, strategic goals of that organization. Um, excellent question. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I think we've we've reached, there's a lot, there's so many questions. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who's been here today. Thank you for taking the time to come here and, and listen uh, to me speak for a whole hour. Um, just really appreciate all of us, uh, all of you being here. And um, if this is the beginning of your journey in DEI, welcome. Uh, if you've been here for a while, then I hope you found our presentation to be informative and engaging. Um, and I hope that you check out more webinars by CCDI in the future. We do have some free webinars uh, throughout the year. So keep an eye on our website. Um, and for any employer partners, make sure to use that knowledge repository as well. So thank you, everyone. Again, have a wonderful rest of your day and take care. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. For more information on upcoming events, please visit our website 
at ccdi.ca.